I was at the first urban conference. It ended September the 8th, 2001, and I moved for the fr from Canada for the first time to New York City on September the 9th, 2001. You didn't have to be a genius to recognize the relationship between the hate of the Durban and the terrorism two days later. The war that we are encountered, not just since 2001, has many fronts. And I think one of the first and most important front is that of the world of ideas. Islamophobia has become the new battleground in this war. I think that the world of human rights has developed a weapon. I call it the human rights weapon. It's one which inverts victim and perpetrator. It's one which is designed to deflect attention from the human rights abuses by those who violate human rights. It is intended to circle the wagons, to invoke mass hysteria, which suggests to people that they are under threat, which is, in fact, imaginary, and to develop excuses for hatred and for terrorism. It's a tried and true formula, after all, isn't it? To create imaginary enemies, to exaggerate what is a kernel of truth, and to divert attention from the real violations in our midst. This is the phenomenon that surrounds the rise of allegations of Islamophobia. The idea is to define victims. And let me give you an example of that. Essentially, Muslims have become, in many ways, the new Jews. The analogy is very deliberate so that in the September of only last month, the Human Rights Council heard the following speech by Pakistan, speaking on behalf of the Organization of the Islamic Conference. Muslims are being demonized and dehumanized as Jews were in the interwar period in the last century. Algeria said that the campaign against Muslims' racial and religious hatred and violence in Europe, legitimated through a twisted vision of freedom of expression, is reminiscent of anti-Semitic campaigns in the 19th 20s and 30s. So the idea is to, um, to turn anti-Semitism on its head, to make Muslims the new Jews, and after all, what is anti-Semitism according to the Organization of the Islamic Conference? Not only did they analogize discrimination against Muslims or Islamophobia to anti-Semitism, they actually said that anti-Semitism is about Arabs and Muslims. So. The consequence of, of this is to then move on to the stage of, well, if Muslims are the, the Jews of the 21st century, what's the shape and form of that discrimination? The Danish cartoon episode has proved to be the kind of the catalyst for a hysterical, one cannot use a better word, exaggeration of the problems uh, faced. Uh, by the Muslim community. And I'll just give you a couple of examples of that also drawn from the Human Rights Council in September. Egypt said, the episode of the offensive publication of portraits of Prophet Muhammad has highlighted the damage that freedom of speech, if left unchecked, may lead to hurting the religious feelings of more than a billion people. Or Syria said that this episode of freedom of opinion was used to insult hundreds of millions of Muslims all over the world and to humiliate Islam. Now, the idea that that episode of a few cartoons in a newspaper, uh, no offense to Denmark, but <laughs> it's two-thirds of the way to the North Pole, is of course preposterous. And it has very specific consequences. It's not just idle chit-chat. So that the United Nations Human Rights Council adopted a resolution called defamation of religions on the basis of this. This has happened in this year. This resolution was adopted by a vote which saw every Western democracy vote against, uh, but was adopted nonetheless. And it says, noting with deep concern the increasing trend in recent years of statements attacking religions, Islam and Muslims in particular, and then it goes on to express concern over various forms of this. But what's interesting is this resolution called defamation of religions only mentions one religion. 
Islam is the only religion that apparently is subject to defamation in the world today. The inexorable push towards isolated view of human rights violations is most obviously indicated by another resolution which was adopted in September, September 28th, uh, again over the objection of every Western democracy, in which the UN decided to rename the anti-discrimination unit of the office of the UN High Commissioner. The unit shall now be called the anti-racial discrimination unit and its operational activity shall focus exclusively on racism, racial discrimination and xenophobia. So you can't even do general anti-discrimination work in the context of the anti-discrimination unit. Now it's only going to be about religion and which feeds back to their definition of religious discrimination which highlights Islam and Muslims in particular. So that essentially the human rights system of the United Nations, which is very vast, is uh, translated into six languages, webcast around the world, has been uh, hijacked. There, there is no other word for it. And the cri de coeur is Islamophobia. Now, I can give many examples, but there is only one special rapporteur, the UN's word for an, an, a, a human rights investigator, on a specific group of people today on religiously based, and that is a special rapporteur on the situations of Muslims and Arabs in various parts of the world. So you have a defamation of religion resolution only on Islam. You have a special rapporteur investigator only on Muslims and Arabs. What's the next step? The next step is an all-out assault on universality, on the general norms of, of human rights protection started in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And the most, I think, most recent and egregious example of that is what happened in Tehran at early September of, of, of a month and a half ago. There was a conference of the non-aligned movement uh, held in Tehran, and the office, UN High Commissioner Louise Arbour went to Tehran, sat in the front row, listened to Ahmadinejad rail against uh, the Zionist regime um, and the United States, and she gave her own speech. The highest person at the United Nations tasked with implementing the Universal Declaration of Human Rights said, universal human rights are the preeminent vehicle for the promotion in a contextually sensitive way of the commonality of human needs and aspirations. And she also said, universality therefore need not be considered in an inflexible and rigid manner. So what did Iran think about that? Well, the day after she left, they executed 21 people and strung them up in public places from cranes. Uh, the July, they stoned somebody to death for alleged adultery. Uh, that's what they mean by cultural sensitivity in Iran. So she, she would have known that her words in that place at this moment in time would have been uh, misconstrued in, in a way which threatens uh, the whole concept of the protection of human rights. Now, that leads me to the question of, well, why? Why is this happening anyway? Basically, I call it doing the math. The United Nations has 192 members. 117 of them belong to the non-aligned movement, so-called non-aligned movement. It's aligned against the United States and most everything Western democracies stand for. But the largest single voting bloc in the non-aligned movement is the organization of the Islamic Conference, 56 members. They call it 57 because they say Palestine is a country. Largest single voting bloc in the group with the majority of countries in the United Nations. Take the Human Rights Council of the UN. It has 47 members. The majority of seats is, uh, are held or votes are held by the African and Asian Regional Group, and the OIC holds a majority of seats within the Asian and African Regional Groups. So they control everything that goes on at the Human Rights Council. I it isn't a surprise. They want a vote, they get a vote, that's the end of the discussion. So it's important to understand that this is strictly a matter of numbers, a, a game which we cannot win at the United Nations. The question has to be asked, how genuine is this concern with human rights violations against Muslims? Well, 70% of all the resolutions ever adopted at the Human Rights Council in its first year and a half of operation, coming on the heels of the so-called reform of the UN Human Rights Commission, are about Israel. Nothing on honor killings against Muslim women, nothing against suicide bombers killing thousands of Muslims in Iraq, nothing on stoning of Muslim women under the criminal code in so many uh, Muslim states, nothing about pu public executions in, in Iran, nothing about systematic torture in Egypt. So are, are they serious about their concern for human rights violations against Muslims? No. The only 
time that they feigned this kind of uh, consideration is when the perpetrator is non-Muslim or alleged perpetrator. There hasn't been a single resolution on genocide in Sudan, on anything in Sudan, directed at the human rights violations in Sudan in the General Assembly for the last five years, th though the victims are Muslim. There are, however, 22 resolutions on Israel. Uh, it's also interesting to note that of 2006, in the last four years, the top most criticized UN member states for human rights violations across the UN system, number one, Israel, number two, Sudan, number three, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and number four, the United States of America. Of all the subsidiary bodies of the UN General Assembly, there are six on Palestinians, none on any other specific people on Earth. So the concern for human rights is, is what you might say, highly selective. Where does this leave us? This is, as I say, not idle chit-chat. With respect to terrorism, there is no definition of the United Nations of terrorism. On the contrary, on October the 10th, the non-aligned movement made the following speech at the United Nations. We call for the definition of terrorism to differentiate it from the legitimate struggle of peoples under colonial or alien domination and foreign occupation for self-determination and national liberation. The brutalization of peoples kept under foreign occupation is the gravest form of terrorism. So what do they mean by that? They mean killing Americans and Israelis is, is not terrorism. The organization of the Islamic Conference said, we reaffirm that to resolve outstanding issues related to the legal definition of terrorism, particularly on the distinction between terrorism and people's struggle for self-determination against foreign occupation. So for as far as they're concerned, this assault on the human rights system directly relates to legitimizing terrorism. And one, for example, can point to the many letters of the Palestinian UN ambassador to the Security Council where he calls suicide killers routinely martyrs. So martyrdom has become a, another UN category which is taking hold. These two things go hand in hand. The, if you can paint yourself a victim, if you can claim the other guy is the, <coughs> the human rights violator, if you become the victim of racism and Islamophobia, then you justify the so-called struggle against the enemy of human rights. As Pakistan said, terrorist acts carried out by non-state actors in the name of religion should be delinked from religion. So we're going to pretend that terrorism, even though it's done in the name of religion, has nothing to do with religion. Pakistan continues, the international community must address the root causes of terrorism. What are they? such as the repression against Muslims. So we're going to turn every Muslim everywhere as subject to discrimination. You know, countries with their terrific record of uh, freedom of expression went on to talk about freedom of opinion has been utilized to humiliate Islam, cause hatred, instigate violence. So we, kn we no longer know whether there are universal standards, uh, what they are, um, who's a victim, who's a perpetrator, the idea is to confuse the enemy and then ultimately to, to excuse terrorism. And I think that the, the biggest UN lie of all, again, as the OIC says, is that the international media continues to use the misguided actions of a small extremist minority as an excuse to malign the entire Muslim world as well as the religion of Islam. The international community must address the root causes of terrorism, <laughs> such as repression against Muslims. So it leaves us in a situation where the irony is that, that in the very states in which there is no freedom of religion, bear in mind, freedom of religion is now used by these countries uh, to have the audacity to become their calling card. And we're faced with an assault which begins with the war of ideas but ends with the potential to repeat 9-11. Uh, Thank you.